In this video, we are going to look at the topic of branching in a microprocessor. First, we will look at how the program counter allows us to implement the concept of branching, look at different ways in which the program counter can be updated, and then we will look briefly at some of the instructions that actually implement the branching operation in a processor. In order to understand why branching is required, let's look at the regular instruction flow first. In general, when we write a program, and over here we have a small snippet of a C program, the instructions by themselves would consist of a sequence of operations, typically arithmetic or logical operations, and the instruction addresses themselves would need to increment sequentially. On every clock cycle, the increment would typically be by a value of four, which corresponds to four bytes or 32 bits. This is of course, assuming that we are working with a 32 bit processor as in the RISC-V 32i instruction set. So what does this translate into in terms of assembly language? On the right, we have the corresponding assembly language, which would be obtained if we ran GCC minus C on this code. As you can see, there are a sequence of operations the first two operations, the add i and the store word, and the first three in fact, correspond to general logic that is implemented anytime that you enter a function and is part of the ABI, the application binary interface, as implemented in C. After that, however, you can see that there is a sequence of operations consisting of load words, add, store, load, add, store, and so on. Each of those load, add, store operations essentially corresponds to one of the x equal to x plus one statements on the C code. In other words, intuitively, what it means is that X is equal to X plus one is translated into three instructions. First, load the value of X from a memory location, add one to it, and store the value back into the same memory location. As you can see over here, the set of operations that need to be executed is just a sequential list one after the other. There is no flow control. In other words, there is no change in the pattern in which the program needs to execute. On the other hand, as you can imagine, this leads to a very limited set of operations that you can implement. Let's consider a simple additional requirement. We want to do conditional e execution. In this C code, you can see that there is one condition where we check if X is greater than five, X is equal to zero. Now, of course, don't worry about the actual meaning of this code. We are not interested in whether X can actually become greater than five. That of course depends on the initial value of X. And since I have not initialized it in this code, we strictly speaking cannot say whether or not X will ever exceed five, but that doesn't matter. The point was to illustrate what happens if there is such an uh, if statement or a conditional execution that needs to be performed. What would this translate into in terms of assembly language? As you can see over here, one new instruction comes in along with the load add store. We have a BGE, which is branch greater than equal. In other words, we are checking whether X is greater than five. And how do we do that? We basically take the value five and load it into X 15. We take the value X 14, which has the corresponding the current value of X, compare the two. And if X is greater than five, we perform one operation. If it is not, we perform something else. So as you can see over here, when X is greater than five, we jump. In other words, we come to this point in the code where we load a different set of values into X and proceed further from there. So this BGE instruction, in other words, has allowed us to break the control flow. This instruction, instruction number 30, may never get executed if X had the value greater than five. And that is precisely what we need branching instructions for. One more place where we might need branches is in order to implement loops. An example is a for loop that we have over here. What does this translate into an assembly language? You can see that it actually ends up generating slightly complicated code. But if you look carefully at it, you'll realize that the gist of the code is captured in this line number 38, where we check whether the loop condition has not been satisfied. And if it is not, 
we come back here that is to line number 14 that is label l3 where we once again continue the loop so this in other words all of these instructions form what is called the loop body so we can see in this case that the same bge instruction could also have been used for implementing a for loop in general just one conditional execution one conditional operation of this kind should be sufficient in order to implement most of the checks that we need to perform but typically processors add a few other instructions just for convenience because otherwise you would need to rewrite your code in such a way that a particular condition has to be always translated into something being greater than or equal to something else which may end up adding extra code and making it more inconvenient so in other words what we want to do with control flow is to change the flow of execution of the program as we saw in the earlier two examples we may either want to skip over certain sections or repeat certain sections several times the main requirement as far as this is concerned from an implementation point of view is that we should be able to update the program counter with a value as needed the program counter holds the instruction address that is the address from which the next instruction is to be read and if we are able to change this value then we can essentially jump to any part of the memory or the program and start reading instructions from there thereby changing the flow of execution of the program the default operation of the program counter is always to add four thereby going to the next instruction in sequence in memory however we can change this by using certain kind of jump instructions where the pc the program counter value is changed based on the instruction it could either be a conditional branch as in the cases that we saw earlier or an unconditional branch to some other po a point in the code now how can all of this get implemented in hardware this picture shows us pretty much the entire data path that we have built up so far as you would recall we started with the alu which is the first part that we wanted to implement essentially what we said was if we get two inputs and some some kind of an alu operation code we should be able to execute that operation and get an output from the alu the alu by itself is essentially a combinational piece of logic the register file was the second thing that we brought in and its sole purpose was to feed the alu with appropriate data and also to take the outputs of the alu if required and store them for further operations the next thing we looked at was the instruction memory as well as the data memory in both cases we needed to store large amounts of data either we store the program that is the instructions which of course we assumed were just a sequence of instructions one after the other or we actually stored the data on which the system was operating this data could either be pulled into the registers or could get updated with values from the registers so all of these things could be used in order to implement the basic operations that is the alu and the load store part the rest of it comes in from the pc that we have over here and the typical operation is just this add four to the pc and loop back on the other hand we could have a situation where we branch where the branch operations are essentially executed by means of taking part of the instruction adding it to the program counter if necessary and finally generating a new program counter value that is fed back so this picture in other words shows us the entire data path it shows us all the components that we need in order to implement all the instructions required for a processor this picture elaborates on the same uh, same diagram but by adding in the control signals the signals that you can see in blue label reg write alu operation branch zero mem write and mem read and the oval block labeled control essentially correspond to the control flow part of the architecture the control block is responsible for essentially decoding the instruction and generating the rest of the signals the reg write alu operation whether to read or write from memory all of those are generated by the control along with a signal that tells whether or not it's a branch operation which when combined with 
some output from the ALU, probably an equality check or something like that, could tell you whether or not a branch should be taken. In other words, should the PC get its value from the updated program counter value or directly from PC plus four. As you can see, the muxes that we have over here are the crucial part in terms of how all of this actually gets implemented. The details of the implementation we will look at in a later video.